began studying about this great throne in Daniel 7 and 9, and he is continuing to give more words concerning his vision that he saw. And the word in verse number 9, he said, I beheld. Now the word beheld there means a continual looking at something, not just a slight gaze. It's not just simply to, it doesn't mean just to you know, glance at something and then move to another object. It means a continual, constant looking at this. So in this vision, what he saw commanded his attention to the point where he couldn't get his eyes off of it. That's what the word here in the Hebrew actually means. And it means to just stare at something, to gaze at something. And he did so, and when in so doing, he said, till the thrones, now notice these, this word here, thrones, is in the plural, meaning more than one throne. These thrones were cast down. Now the word cast down in the Hebrew there, uh, I, you said, do you know Hebrew? Well, I've got a great dictionary, you know. <laughs> that helps a lot. I studied Hebrew and I studied Greek, but the thing about it is they didn't take on me very good. It's, you know, and if, if you study something and it doesn't take on you, you don't do very good with it. But I tell everybody I know a little Hebrew and he runs the dry cleaners and I know a little Greek and he makes hot dogs. So that's about the extent of my personal knowledge. But over the years, I've caught on to a lot of stuff. But the, the word here, and I'm going to write it here, it's cast. He said till the, the, he saw these thrones cast down. Now in our way of this interpretation of this, in our way of, of speaking in English in 2022, it would mean these thrones are set up. That's what it means. They're set up for a particular purpose. And this throne that you see in verse number 9 of Daniel is a judgment throne because the, it interprets itself because the Bible said that the, and this is the vision of the judgment of the Antichrist, which we'll study later. He's called, in verse 11, he said, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. So this horn in the vision is the Antichrist. He's able to speak words. He's a human being who can speak words. And he said, I beheld even till the beast was slain. Revelation 13 tells us that one of the names of the Antichrist is the beast. Okay? So this is a person. This is a human being who is empowered by Satan himself who will come eventually in the future after the rapture of the church now, I'm a pre-trib, pre-millennial Bible teacher. There are three schools of thought about the rapture. Most of us who, who are conservative Bible believers, we believe the rapture will occur before the Great Tribulation. Others put it in the middle of the tribulation. And then others, the amillennial, somebody said, what are they? They just say, ah, to all of it. <laughs> no, they don't believe in any of it. And there's many denominations like that. They say it's not real and all this kind of stuff. But we believe that the rapture will occur at the end of the church dispensation that we are now in. And when the bride is completed and Jesus knows all about that, he's going to come and he's going to rapture his church out into the heavenly realm. So then the beast will take over. And then in verse 11, notice the pronoun, his body destroyed. So he's using a male pronoun of his and he, and he can speak, so he's talking, this horn can speak. So he's talking about the Antichrist here, and he's talking about the judgment of the Antichrist. Now on this throne, the Bible said in verse number 9, sat the Ancient of Days. And he describes him in very vivid description. Notice he said the garment was white as snow, hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. A thousand thousands, plural. The heavenly host is gathered there in that throne room, you might say. Now, may I say to you, there's three words I want to give you about the throne room in, by way of introduction. This is my introduction, and I couldn't write it all on the board for you. You'll just have to take notes if you want to. 
But there are three aspects of God's throne throughout the Bible, and we'll get into this in just a minute. Heaven has a throne room. The throne room at times can be set and does and is set as a courtroom, which in this, this part of Daniel is because it's a judgment throne. And then you'll notice, which we'll get in Revelation, you can see what I'm talking about. And then in other occasions, on other occasions, well, I, I can't write. You all know that, don't you? It's, it's set up as a war room. There are war plans made in the heavenlies that affect all things on the earth. And we'll give you that from 1 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 18, and we'll talk about that as much as we have time. Now, I'm trying to be, get, get going here so that we can understand. Well, first of all, let me, uh, let me talk about heaven being, uh, number one, a throne room. And God is seated there on His throne. Uh, you say, well, how do we know this is all real? Is there a real... And people question, is heaven real or is it fictitious? Is it sort of like a fairy story of some kind? And I heard many years ago that there was a family in our locality who had a small girl killed in a car wreck. And uh, they attended a church that was not a conservative church, doctrinally, but a liberal church. And at the funeral, the pastor more or less took away their hope of heaven by telling them that heaven was sort of like a uh, Alice in Wonderland type experience. Well, may I say to you, that's not true. Heaven, number one, there is a real place called heaven. How do we know that? Uh, we know that from the factual uh, thoughts that God expressed in His Word about heaven. Heaven is real. Jesus Christ is real and He's in heaven. He's a man. He's the God-man, and He sits on the throne in heaven. It's very important for us to establish the fact that heaven is real. Do you know that uh, we have there in the Bible, there's people who have actually seen into heaven, and they've given us things that came from heaven. You want me to go into that for just a moment? Number one, Moses. Moses was a man who saw into heaven. In Exodus chapter 25, the Bible says that God uh, took Moses up into the mount. We believe it to be Mount Sinai. That's what the Bible teaches. And the Bible says that um, uh, he was shown the articles of the tabernacle in very strict and vivid form and with the dimensions and the, the measurements and with the, the way they should be made and built and the Bible said in Exodus 25 and 40 that God saw, Moses saw the heavenly tabernacle and was instructed by the Lord to make all of the articles of the tabernacle as he had seen them while he was in the mount. He actually looked up into heaven and saw all of this. Now, if you go to Revelation, you'll find that John mentions the, the temple was opened in heaven and he saw the same things that Moses had seen in the tabernacle. Now, if you've done any studying on the tabernacle in the wilderness, you will discover that the, the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat, had the cherubims, that's where the blood was sprinkled, the blood of atonement was sprinkled at that place. And all of those articles are genuine and they are real. They were real. And Moses looked up into heaven. Hebrews 9 and 23 tells us that these things all had to be purified and cleansed and sprinkled by blood. And so he saw all of that. Ezekiel chapter 1, the Bible said that he uh, saw into heaven and there's a very thorough and detailed account and description of the throne of God in Ezekiel chapter 1 and chapter 2. Jacob is a man in the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis chapter 28, he was fleeing from his brother Esau, and he came to a place that's called Bethel, B-E-T-H-E-L. Bethel, does anybody know? And what I have told you about the, one of the names of God is E-L, L. That's one of the names of God. Anytime you see a word in your Bible that's got the E-L as a prefix or the E-L as a suffix on the end of it, it has something to do with God. Uh, Gabriel, that's an angel, an archangel. Gabriel, the last part of his name. He's the messenger of God. And you, we can just go on. I don't have time to give you all of this. 
But at Bethel, and the word Beth here means house, and he was at the house of God. That's what, that's what the word Bethel means, house of God, Bethel. And so he, there he, he, he's asleep. And in his time of sleeping, he has a vision. What does he see? He sees a ladder that's actually set up on earth, but it extends all the way up into the heavenly world. And he sees the angels of God ascending and descending up and down this ladder. And he sees this. And you say, what was that? That was a Christophany. And Jesus himself, uh, it's revealed in the Gospels in John uh, chapter 2. And he said, henceforth to Nathaniel, he said, from this time forward, you're going to see the Son of Man ascending and descending from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. And so explains it as being Jesus in that form. He actually saw that into the heavenly realm. These people have seen into heaven. Daniel himself, in our study today, he saw the ancient of days sitting on this judgment throne. John, in the book of Revelation, on the Isle of Patmos. You know, John was the only disciple who was not martyred. Of all the disciples of Jesus, uh, they were martyred with the exception of John, the beloved disciple. He lived to be almost 100 years old, 96 years old. They tried to boil him in a kettle of oil, hot oil, and they took a big cauldron and filled it full of oil where the demand could be put into it. They put fire under it, and then they put him in there. But you know, the amazing thing was the oil never would boil. He, he turned red, according to the history, church history. He turned, his flesh turned red, but he never did burn. He never could burn. They couldn't get rid of it. They were going to cook him alive in this uh, oil, and, you know, they took him out and, and they said, well, you know, we can't do anything with this man. So he was actually abandoned to the Isle of Patmos, which is a small rocky island in the Aegean Sea. It was a place where that prisoners were, were taken to because on this island in this rocky environment were salt mines. And these prisoners were shackled and they worked every day digging salt out of these mines and putting them in sacks. They were loaded on ships and taken to countries and so that people could have salt. He was put in one of those caverns, no doubt. And one day while he was there, and every day, you know, they would, through a hole in the top of this cavern, they would, with a rope, extend down some lunch for him or something for him to eat. And so one day he heard a voice in Revelation chapter 4. Instead of uh, uh, bringing him something down through the hole, he said, come up hither, come up here. And he was transported into the heavenly realm in Revelation chapter 4. And he, the entire book of Revelation was given to him in vision form. And he very vividly in Revelation chapter 4, 1 through 4, describes the throne that he saw in heaven. May I turn over there and read that to you because we're going to look at it if we have time. Do you know God's throne is very colorful? There are so many vivid colors associated with the throne. He said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard were as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Now that voice had been used before. In Revelation chapter 1, he heard a voice like a trumpet. In verse 10, and you know what the voice told him? In verse 11, he identified himself, and he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and last. Now, who do you think that was talking to him as the trumpet? That was Jesus. Who is Alpha and Omega? Jesus is Alpha and Omega. And this is, this is who the voice is. He hears this voice as a trumpet. This is Alpha, and this is Omega. And he said, come up hither, come up here, and I will show you th things which must be hereafter. Future tense. He said, and immediately, at once, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. The same words that you find in Daniel chapter 7, when the thrones were cast down or set up in heaven. So he sees almost the same thing described as Daniel described it. He said, he that sat was to look like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne and sight like unto an emerald. And then the remainder of that chapter, you read it for yourself, you find there are 24 seats around the throne. As we see in Daniel when he talks about the thrones plural being set up. 
And he says there's 12 times that the word throne is used in that entire chapter in chapter 4. So he talks about what's around the throne, what's before the throne, what's on the throne, and so on and so forth, uh, the one sitting on the throne. So uh, John saw all of this. He saw into the heavenly realm, folks. You can't deny what's in the Word of God. I don't care what the liberals and the modernists say. Heaven is real. We have factual knowledge of heaven from the Word of God. We see people in the Bible who actually saw into heaven. Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Bible said he was caught up into the third heaven and he actually saw things, he heard words, he said that were unspeakable words, they were unlawful to be uttered. Stephen, the first deacon and evangelist of the first church, the early church, the New Testament church in, the, uh, in Jerusalem, he was martyred for his faith. And the Bible said in Acts chapter 6 and verse 56, you know what he said? He said, behold, I see heavens opened. He saw heavens opened. And the Bible said, he said, I see Jesus, the Son of Man, standing on the right hand of God. He saw, the Bible also said he saw the glory of God. Uh, verse 55 of that chapter said he looked up steadfastly. And you know, the Bible said that they picked up stones and stoned him till he died. They stoned him to death. He was a martyr. I prefer to say they rocked him to sleep because the last part of that verse says, Stephen fell asleep. Oh, he fell asleep. No, not a soul that slept, but his body was at rest. Uh, the Lord, and by the way, that's the only time in your Bible that you can discover where that Jesus, who is seated on the throne at the right hand of God, ever stood up. He is seated as a great high priest. But when Stephen came home as the first martyr of the Christian church and the Christian faith, Jesus stands up to give him an encore, a welcome into the heavenly world. He welcomes the first Christian martyr. Hallelujah. I believe, listen, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Now, I can't prove this entirely by the Word of God, but based on what he did with Stephen, you know what? I believe every time there's a saint of God that goes home to be with the Lord, I believe Jesus is there to welcome you home. I believe He's there. Hallelujah. I do. I have no doubt about it. You know, I always think, I was thinking this morning, I got up and I got my phone on to some good music and I heard Rusty Goodman sing that song, Born to Die. Oh man, I grew up on the good, Happy Goodman family and the Rambos and the Inspirations, those gospel groups. See, we don't have people like that today. These people are dead. And the young people, you know, songs that are written today don't have a lot of depth to them. They just don't. But back in that generation, when I was growing up, boy, I mean, people walked with God. These songwriters were anointed people. They wrote songs that have lived on for years and years and years. Then I heard Rusty Goodman's daughter, uh, Tanya Goodman, sing that song that Rusty wrote, Look for me, for I will be there. And I tell you what, I got such a blessing, honey. I, I had just taken a shower and was getting cleaned up to come to Bible study. And I took off running out of my bathroom to a room that has no furniture. We've moved a lot of the furniture out of our house. And Dana, I'm telling you, if you'd have seen me, you thought I was just wild because I was in that room praising God and thanking God. Heaven is real. Heaven is real to this old boy. I'm going to tell you, I know I'm going to heaven one day. When my life ends on this earth, my life's going to begin over in glory. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, heaven is real. I don't have to have anybody tell me differently because I've got the witness on the inside that tells me that I've got what it takes to get me to glory. Hallelujah. I bowed at, in the sawdust in the tent revival when I was eight years old, and I committed my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And for 63 years now, He's been the everything in my life, and I praise Him for that. If you don't know you're saved, you better try to find something out about it. Amen. Listen, He wants you to know that you're born again. You can have full assurance. Nobody can change my mind. Nobody can tell me. Listen, you could walk up to me today and say, I don't believe you're saved. I'd laugh in your face because I've got the witness on the inside. Amen. Hallelujah. I didn't mean to get this excited, but I can't help it. John, you may have to turn that camera this way and that way to keep me on there. Praise God. I want to tell you something, folks. 
Jesus is real. Heaven is real. All of the throne of God is real. And when I get to studying about it, I can't contain the joy that I feel in my heart knowing that I'm going to be there one day. I'm going to be able to bow before Him and thank Him for what He's done for me and thank Him for the cross. Thank Him for the blood that He shed for me to keep me from going to hell. I would have been in hell today if it hadn't been for Jesus. And I want to tell you something. I've got a lot to praise Him for. I've had three near-death experiences. I've told you about those experiences. And listen, He kept me here for a reason and for a purpose. One of those was to keep on teaching the Word of God to people. Amen. And I'm going to teach till He comes. I'm going to preach till He comes. I'm going to sing till He comes. I'm going to pray till He comes. I'm going to walk this road to glory till He comes. Hallelujah. And one day He's going to say, Come on home, Larry. I'll welcome you into my kingdom. Hallelujah. You know, when Jesus, when, the, when God sent Jesus to this world, now listen, I may say some things that you don't hardly understand, but remember, I've been doing this a long time and I've done a whole lot of studying. And Jesus came to this world not just so you would have Jesus. That was only part of the reason why He came. He came with a kingdom in mind. It's called the kingdom of heaven. It's found 33 times in the book of Matthew. The word kingdom of heaven. Jesus is a king and Jesus has a kingdom. But what did he say when he came? He said, this king, my kingdom is not of this world or my servants would fight. But his kingdom is a heavenly kingdom. Now when, when God made Adam in the Garden of Eden and spoke life into that formless body, Adam rose up full of the life of God, the breath of God. God came into him. He, he blew his breath into Adam. Are you with me? The body without the spirit is dead, James tells us. And so Adam was the first man. He was prophet, he was priest, and he was king. And God placed him and gave him dominion. If you read your Bible, he had dominion over all of God's creation. When God decided to make all the animal world, what did he do? He passed them by Adam and said, Adam, you name them. Adam had the right to do that because he was the co-regent with God. God made him in his likeness and image, which was a mental likeness, an emotional likeness, and a spiritual likeness. Now, God doesn't have a human body other than the second person of the Godhead, who is Jesus Christ. John 4, 24 said, God is a spirit, and a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as we see uh, that we know about in our, our, our world. God is everywhere all over the world simultaneously. He is omnipresent, He is omniscient, and He is omnipotent. But He describes Himself in biblical language so that we can comprehend Him from our minds that we have. We have finite minds. Old Dr. Ralph Sexton Sr. used to say this. He said if one, one of God's thoughts got loose in your brain, it would explode it in a second time. That's how great God is. But see, he describes himself with ears and with hands, with eyes, and so on and so forth, so we can comprehend him on our level. Now, God is a spirit being, and you, you know, and, and we'll get into that, but here's what he, he put Adam on this world to, you know what he wanted? He wanted the earth to be like heaven was. But Adam blew it. He called it paradise. It was the Garden of Eden. Eden is another word for heaven in the Hebrew language. But see, Adam blew all of that. Adam and Eve sinned. And Jesus, when, when they and by the way, God had all this mapped out from eternity past. See, God doesn't live in the realm of time. There is no time in His world. It's eternity. And it's timeless. You never have a clock in heaven to look at. There is no time in eternity. And God sees the future as if it has already occurred. That's how He sees it. He's God. He's timeless. He's eternal. And you know, before Adam ever sinned, God had a plan. He did. It was a plan of redemption. And in that plan, it included sending the last Adam, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, where was Jesus in eternity before He came to earth as a baby? John chapter 1 said He was in the bosom of the Father. 
Now look the word bosom up in your Greek lexicon and you will discover that it means this. Now keep in mind, Old Testament and New Testament people in that era of time wore, they didn't wear jeans and shirts like we do. We're Westerners. They didn't have clothing like we do. What did they do? Both men and women wore robes. They wore long flowing robes. Now how many remember seeing any images on TV of our president's recent, recent visit to Saudi Arabia? Did you notice how the men were dressed? They were wearing what? Tell me. They were wearing robes. Well, that's Old New Testament all the way to New Testament. They wore robes. They didn't wear clothes like we wear. That's why I laugh when I hear these preachers, and we don't hear them much anymore because most preachers now are educated and um, used to hear a lot of these old country preachers saying, bless God, you women need to get your own clothes. You know, women wear women's clothes. Listen, I want to tell you something. Both men and women wore robes back in the Old Testament days and New Testament days, and you studied. I've got a book on the clothing of Jewish people and how they dressed at the time of Christ, and there's in that book there's diagrams of the way their robes were made. The women's robes had sashes on them and so on. They were made in a different way, but everybody's robe covered them all the way to their feet, both men and women. Well, the word bosom in the Hebrew, Jesus was in the bosom of the Father. Take that robe. It was a full robe, a long flowing robe, and that's what the word bosom means. It means he was in the folds of a robe. He was wrapped up in God the Father as, as something folded up in folds of material or cloth. That's what that word means. Jesus has always been. He's God. He's always been. He just came from heaven to earth through the womb of the Virgin Mary. And that points me back to what I was going to say about heaven. We've People have actually seen into heaven and give us an account of what's going on in eternity. But there's people who actually have been taken from earth to heaven and have seen what's up there. The first man who was ever airlifted off the planet without death was who? Anybody know? Before the flood, there was this man called Enoch. And the Bible said he was translated that he should not see death. The Bible said he had a testimony that he pleased God. There's a book that's not in your Bible called the book of Enoch. There's three, three volumes of it, and it describes the life before the flood and so on. It was written by ancient writers. It's not a, an inspired writing that's been put into your Bible, but it gives you an account of what was going on before the flood. I have one of those in my library. It's great to read. And Enoch was a man, the Bible said that he, he had a son named Methuselah. Anybody know anything strange about Methuselah? He was the oldest human being to ever live on this planet. He lived to be 969 years old. Remember what God said to Adam, in the day you eat the fruit thereof, thou shalt surely die. A day with the Lord is as a, what? thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. And so Methuselah could not live a thousand years because man could not live that long. The day you eat the fruit, you'll surely die. A day means a thousand years in God's economy. So his life was only 969 years old, short of a thousand years, 31 years short of being a thousand years old. But the reason God let him stay so long on the planet it's because he was the witness to uh, what God was going to do in telling Noah to build an ark to the saving of his household and getting on board the ark, all who would believe. It had never rained on the planet at that time. They didn't believe Noah's message that it was going to rain, there was going to be a flood, the judgment of God was coming. Nobody believed him, but he, his wife, three sons and their wives, that's eight people. Eight is the number of a new beginning in Bible numerology. And so they got on board the ark. But before all of this happened, Methuselah continued to live year after year until 969 years, and he died, and his name means when he is gone, it will come. The Hebrew word for Methuselah means when he is gone, it will come, speaking about the flood. That was God's way of telling those people. He left Methuselah here all those years because he's a merciful God. He doesn't want nobody to go to hell. 
The Bible said God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's your word in your Bible. God loves the world, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, that means people, mankind, that He gave His only begotten Son. If people go to hell, they go as an intruder on the grace of God and the love of God because God doesn't want them there. He wants everybody who will commit to Him to be in heaven one day. Hallelujah. Is it? We can tell that to people. There's nobody that God will not save if they'll repent of their sin and call upon Him. Praise God, He's willing to save all who will come to Him by faith. The Bible said He saves to the uttermost all that will come to God by faith. So Methuselah was a sign to those people. The day he died, that was the day that the flood preparations for the flood began. It was time for the ark to be uh, uh, finished and opened up so that people could get on board the ark before the wrath and God of judgment of God came. Methuselah's daddy was Enoch, and the Bible said that he lived such a righteous and holy life. He walked with God, the Bible said, and God would come down and walk with him, and as they walked one day, God said to Enoch, I'm sure, and you're not going to read this in your Bible, this is Lariology. God said to Enoch one day, he said, Enoch, he said, the sun's getting ready to set. Either you or I one are going to have to separate. I'm going to go to my home and you'll go to your home on earth. I'll go to my home on heaven. And Enoch said to God, he said, well, why don't you just take me home with you and let me spend the night? And you know what God did? He translated him that he should not see death. He took old Enoch by the hand and just carried him on through the heavenly realm up to the throne of God, the, the abode of God. And by the way, the Bible says there's no night there. And so he's still with God. Hallelujah. He's still in heaven with God. He, he actually was taken into heaven without dying. A second Old Testament character. I know we're not going to get much on the throne today because I've just got 15 more minutes, but I'm having a good time giving it to you anyway. Are you having a good time when joining? Hallelujah. Well, we had two people that said they were. That's good. That's good. The rest of you, I hope that you can get something out of it. I mean, I'm trying. I'm doing the best I know how. The second Old Testament character was who? He went to heaven without dying. In 2 Kings chapter 2, you'll find it. His name is Elijah. He's the prophet of God. He's the prophet of fire. You know, associated with him, he's the one that prayed 63 words in your English Bible and called fire down from God out of heaven on Mount Carmel. I've been there in the cave of Elijah when I went to Israel. I've been to Mount Carmel and saw where all that took place. So it's very interesting, of course. And you know, the Bible said that he told Elijah, said, said go anoint a prophet to take your place. And of course, he sees Elisha out plowing in the Bible. Elisha was a farmer. And he's out plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. Now, how many oxen would that be at a double yoke? 12 times 2 is what? So Elisha was plowing with a plow that was being pulled by 24 oxen. That's a pretty good plow. And that's, a, uh, I mean, listen, most people didn't have that kind of, they didn't, they didn't have money to buy that many oxen. So evidently his family were rich farmers. And he was out there working in the fields. And you know, uh, Elisha comes along and he says to him, he, and by the way, you said, well, you're reading between the lines. Well, if you'll read the lines, God will let you see stuff between the lines. I mean, these people live normal lives. The Bible's not a history book of every detail that they lived. They talked, they had conversation, they laughed, they played games. You know, the Bible is just the inspired writing that God has given us, but these people had natural lives. And Elisha was out there in the hot sun sweating and, and, and plowing. How many's ever plowed? I have. My grandfather taught me how to plow with a team of horses. How many think you would like to enjoy all day long following a horse who was snorting and sweating with a hot, in a hot sun? Well, what about 24 oxen? I mean, here you are plowing and holding the plow, and all you see is the backside of 24 oxen. And all you smell is what they emit. Hardly a good life, I'd say. Elijah said to him, Hey, Elisha, and Elijah had this mantle on. It was an old leather mantle that he wore. But spiritually, it spoke of the anointing of God upon him. And he threw his mantle on Elisha. Are you with me? And the Bible said, what did Elisha do when he got that call from the prophet of God? He stopped plowing. 
He burnt the plow. He slaughtered the oxen. <laughs> they had a big barbecue to celebrate his leaving the farm. And he never returned again. He had a second anointing. He had a double portion of the power and spirit of Elijah upon him, the Bible said. And Elijah performed nine miracles. Elisha performed 18 miracles in his ministry. Oh, think of it. Elijah was a hairy man, the Bible said. Elisha was a bald-headed man. Remember on one occasion, there was a bunch of kids came out and they were saying to him, Hey, old baldy, go up, old baldy. You know what they were saying? Why don't you go on up like Elijah, your predecessor, did? Go up. Go on up, old baldy. And you know what God did? He had some female bears there hidden in the thicket. And he spoke to them and said, Go over and eat those kids up. You say, God did that? Yeah, God did. He, he's in control of the animal world too. That's part of His control. He's in control of everything, folks. We, see, we don't like to admit, people don't want you to talk about God being in control and they don't want you to talk about God sitting on a judgment throne because they don't want to believe that they have to face Him one day with their lives. But the Bible said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. There's coming a moment in eternity when every person who has ever lived from Adam to the last person on the planet will stand before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if they're not saved, the Bible said, He's going to say unto them, Depart, I never knew you. And I'm here to tell you that when that day comes, Every knee will be bowing to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and every tongue will be confessing that they're lost, that, that He's right, He's righteous, He's just, He's holy, and he'll, they'll be consigned to the never-ending lake of fire, the Bible tells us. Well, I, I hope that you can get something out of this. I'm preaching today and I know it, but that's okay. Listen, you'll get, you'll get it in time. Praise God, Elijah. Now let's go to the New Testament. The Bible said that Jesus in Acts chapter 1 he was speaking to him. It was, it was 50 to 40 days after the resurrection. And he, sa he said to his disciples and all of them, and by the way, he was seen of over above, above 500 brethren at one time, the Bible says. And they, he carries them out over to the Mount of Olives there. And as he is speaking to them and giving them last minute instructions, all of a sudden his feet began to airlift off the planet. And the Bible said he was taken up into the clouds. So Jesus went back to where he came from. He's the third person that was airlifted off the planet. There are seven, seven experiences in the Bible, events in the Bible of seven people that have been taken up in bodily form into the heavenly realm. Paul was one of them. I've already mentioned him. The John chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 4, John was caught up. The Bible said he was taken up. In the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, there's going to be two witnesses come in the middle part of the great tribulation period. I believe them to be Moses and Elijah. Some Bible commentators say it's going to be Enoch and Elijah because they're the two Old Testament characters that went to heaven without dying. I don't think Enoch is one of them. I think Moses is one of them because it says in the days of their prophecy that they had the power to turn water into blood and, and all that went on in Egypt. I believe that's Moses. And then Elijah had power to call fire down out of heaven, and that's what he's going to do in the great tribulation period. So I believe is it Moses and Elijah. I believe they're coming back as two witnesses. And now all the world will see them. It's necessary that they see them. Listen, people will have them out. They'll have their phones out. They'll be watching old Mo, and they'll be watching old Elijah. And, and the Bible said they're going to hate them because they represent God Almighty out of heaven. They're going to be hated and they're going to be killed in the streets of Jerusalem. And their dead bodies will lie in the streets there for three days. Read this in your Bible in Revelation chapter 11. I'm not telling you something out of a comic book. I'm telling you what the Word of God has to say. And you know I'm a Bible believer. I am one of the strictest Bible believers you've ever read. I don't, I don't err from it. I stick with it and tell you exactly what the Word of God teaches us. And listen, there, the Bible said suddenly God's going to breathe His life into them and resurrect them and they're going to be caught up and taken back up into heaven. People are going to see this on TV of wherever they are on their phones. People are going to be able to see all of this and the world's going to know that. And, and by the way, 
the greatest one of all that's going to be airlifted out of here is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in the rapture of the church. When Jesus comes, He's going to come and He's going to open the graves of all of our dead loved ones who have died with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. The Bible said they're going to, the dead in Christ shall rise first and then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Listen, there's people going to, who have gone to heaven in their bodies. They've been given a glorified body to be able to live in that environment. You can't even, you couldn't even go to the moon without being in a pressurized suit. Astronauts have to have pressurized suits and they lose their weight. They're weightless in eternity. Some of you are glad of that, aren't you? Uh, I am. I won't have this belly when I have a glorified body. I'll look like, I'll look like Charles Atlas. <laughs> oh, dream on, Larry. <laughs> dream on, Larry. Hallelujah. But listen, we'll have glorified bodies. You couldn't, you couldn't live in eternity in a natural body. You would disintegrate. Study space. You'll see there's a place, and I can't tell you where it's at, but listen, when astro astronauts leave here in pressurized uh, uh, rockets with pressurized suits, there is a point in their travels where they leave time and go into space. It's entirely a different situation. How many saw pictures years ago when when the man landed on the moon. Now we've got, there's some people still believe they didn't do that. I, my grandmother never did believe they had landed on the moon. She said they just made those up. She said God would never let people walk on the moon. Well, they walked on the moon. They planted an American flag on the moon. I saw it with my own eyes. Now we didn't have a TV. My dad and mother were so strict they wouldn't let us have a television. They wouldn't let us read comic books. Every Sunday morning when the Sunday morning paper hit the door, my mother and dad went to the door and they took the, the funny page out, the funny paper out, and they shredded it before our very eyes or they put it in the furnace and burned it because that was of the devil. I'm not lying to you. And to this day, <laughs> I've never read a funny book. I've read, a, I've read a book that gives me a lot of fun. It's called The Bible. I've never, I've never played cards because my dad and mother said that was of the devil. I've never had a drink of liquor in my mouth or wine, alcohol, or any of that stuff. I've never smoked a cigarette. I was raised like this, and I was raised, bless God, if you do this stuff, you'll die and go to hell. And to this day, I still believe if you smoke, you'll go to hell. No, I don't believe that. I'm just kidding you. I was raised like, listen, if, when I was growing up, if I saw a preacher go out behind one of these country churches on a homecoming day and grab him a cigarette and light it up and smoke it, I said, oh, he just preached this morning. Now he's out there smoking. I'm telling you, boy, my parents, listen, you said they were extreme. Well, you know why? They didn't want us to get involved in that stuff. I've seen my mother take, you know, she would take a, like a magazine that, Sometimes people would give us, we didn't take magazines, but sometimes people in the church, they felt sorry for us. They'd give her a better homes and garden or something like that, or maybe some other magazine. Or sometimes they, they wanted my dad to read an article in a magazine about stuff that was going on in the world. And there'd be beer ads in those magazines. I've seen them go through the magazine before they'd let us look at them, and they'd tear out the cigarette ads, and they'd tear out the beer ads, and they'd throw them in the trash can so we couldn't see that. I'm telling you, folks, I was raised like this. I was raised by people like this. And then you want to know why I'm like I am? I never would let my boys have these uh, video games that had, and by the way, the video games that's going on today, you better not let your ha kids or grandkids have them. They're full of demonic stuff. Listen, that's why we have all these riots and murders and police officers being killed. In these video games, they shoot people down, they kill them, and they think nothing about it, and it, it causes their mind to get insensitive to murder. Listen, I'm telling you, you better be careful about what you let your kids see and what you let your grandkids see. I'm telling you, if you've got any control over them, now most of us don't have any control over our grandkids. I threatened to, to paddle one of mine the other day, 
And my son said, do you mean you would paddle him for that? I said, if he don't obey me, I will. He said, now, Dad, he said, I'd have a problem with you if you paddled my boy. I said, well, I paddled you, didn't I? He said, yeah, too much. I said, well, you were too mean. That's why I had to paddle you a lot, you know. And I, he said, you know what you always said before you gave me a whipping? He said, you'd say, now, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it hurts you. He said, but Dad, I figured it out. It didn't hurt you in the same place it hurt me. <laughs> it did. It hurt my heart. He told me one day, you know, both of my sons have come. I, now, don't get the idea that I was just beating around on my boys all the time. I didn't. I didn't. Listen, I made, I made a promise to myself if I ever had kids, I would never slap them in the face because that's one of the most horrible things you can do to cause your child to not have any self-esteem about himself. I know. I experienced it many times. It's degrading to a child. They think you don't care for them. They think you don't love them. Uh, it, it causes them to feel like they're nothing and nobody when you beat around on them. Listen, if I told them I'm, I'm going to give you a spanking, I gave it to them, but I did it in the right way. And, you know, I, Derek told his mother the other day, he said, you know, said every time that you had to deal with me, he said, he said you'd get a hold of me and you'd start praying over me. He, she, said, she said, well, it calmed you down, didn't it? And, you know, I'd pray with my boys. After they got whipped, I prayed, the Lord heal them. I didn't pray. You all, I tell you, you all need to laugh a little bit. You need to laugh a little bit. I said, Lord, the Bible said stripes were laid on Jesus back for our healing. I said, Lord, heal them. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If this goes out, people are going to be, they're going to be contacting me. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just joking and cutting up. But I tell you what, the Bible says, you know, that... Um, God, God tells us in the book of Proverbs that we're to care enough about our kids to where we have guidelines for them to live by and we have uh, parameters and borders and they don't cross those. If they do, they get in trouble. And there's other ways of discipline besides corporal punishment, and I know that. And I wasn't great big on corporal punishment because every time I had to give, and I never did give my boys that many whippings, but every time I had to give them a whipping or whatever you want to call it, a spanking or whatever, I always just used my leather belts the way I did it. And I just folded up and I'd hit them not more than three times and I'd just paddle their bottoms about three times with the leather belt. And Derek told me the other day, he said, Dad, I grew up one day as a teenager and you told me, he said, I was about 12 years old and you said, Derek, this better be the last whipping I have to give you for anything. You're old enough to know better and you're old enough to act right now and you don't need any more whippings. You need, to, you need to straighten up. And he said, then I looked in the bedroom in there to see what you were doing. You were sitting there in a chair crying. And he said, how can you, how can you feel like your dad was being too much on you when you saw him sitting there crying? I said, Derek, it hurt me right in my heart to have to do that because I had such a great love for you. Listen, don't you think it hurts the heart of God when we sin and He has to discipline us? And He does. He says He chastens us. And He does in many forms of it, I'm sure. Well, the class time is over and I've not gotten to the throne. I promise you that we're, we're working on it and we're going to get to it. I've got some great stuff that I want to share with you about the throne. Why don't you read this week before next Tuesday, read Daniel, of course, but also read Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2. And then also read Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Well, read the entire chapter, and you're going to get set up for next week's lessons. We want to talk about the, the description of the throne from these verses right here. And then we want to talk about the dynamics of the throne and what's going on in heaven associated with the throne. I'm going to whet your appetite for this. Do you know that God's throne is not stationary? It's not always located in one place. It's in your Bible, in the book of Ezekiel. There are throne bearers that when he, decree, when he speaks and says he wants to move throughout the heavens, his throne, he doesn't leave his throne to do that. He is carried. The, there, the word for throne is the same word as chariot in your Bible. I'm going to bring all this out. 
In Ezekiel, he described it as wheels under the throne of God, and he saw the throne of God moving. Wheels is another classification of angelic beings that are throne bearers of the throne. There are angels that are throne protectors. There are angels that are assigned to protect the holiness of God. The seraphim, we're going to talk about the seraphim and what they are and how they're made. We're going to talk about the cherubim. Now, I think in the year 1679 or something, there was a man by the name of John Milton that wrote two books. One of them was called Paradise Lost and one Paradise Regained. And in Paradise Lost, he depicts cherubims as little baby angels flying around in heaven. That is not true. There are no such thing as baby angels. If I want an angel to guard me and protect me, I don't want a little baby doing it. Cherubims are not, he calls them cherubs because the Bible mentions cherubs. And by the way, Lucifer was a cherub in Ezekiel chapter 28, Isaiah chapter 14. He's called a cherub. He was of and is of the classification of angels that are cherubims. Has anybody ever taught you about angels? Okay, we're going to be talking about the seraphim, the cherubim, and the wheels that Ezekiel saw, which is a type of angel that controls the movements of God in eternity and His throne. And David saw this. Ezekiel saw this. Uh, it's important that I teach you what the Bible says, and I'm going to try my best to do that next week about the throne of God. Father, we thank you for this time, and we pray your blessings on this time. And we pray, Lord, you'll use this to give us word about the greatness of our God and what he's doing now in eternity and what he plans to do in the future. In Jesus' precious name.